Perspectivas Latinas, a community service of CAN TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Hernandez. Today, our guests are Sol Flores and Cristina Obregón of the organization La Casa Norte. La Casa Norte focuses on helping youth and families confronting homelessness. Welcome. Thank you. Let's start off by talking about you individually and your role at the organization. Yeah, so I'm uh, born and raised in Chicago, a proud mm -hmm. uh, product of the Chicago public school system. Mm -hmm. uh, and my uh, grandparents migrated from Puerto Rico in the mm -hmm. 1950s and had a large family here on the northwest side of Chicago. What's the large family? Yeah, so my grandparents <laughs> had seven kids. Wow. Then they were, they were one of the first Latino foster care families in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. so they fostered 200 kids over the course of 20 years and wow. adopted four more. So a very large family. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what, what do you do? I, I know you're the founder, but tell yeah, me. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I'm the founding executive director, uh, and I actually met mm -hmm. our founding board members oh, okay. uh, about 12 and a half years ago, and I was actually volunteering at a church in the Humble Park community full time, mm -hmm. and uh, these people had been for a long time interested in the issues of homeless youth and families and had mm -hmm. identified Humble Park as a community of need, but also as a mm -hmm. community that would support them. And I met the volunteering and they said, will you help a little bit? And that little bit turned into 110%. And on <laughs> July 1st, 2002, mm -hmm. I became the founding executive director of La Casa Norte. You got pulled in. I did. And I got called. Leave. You got called? <laughs> I got a called. divine call? Uh, I would say I met in a church basement, so yes, right? When, well, I, sometimes I tell my God story, right? But <laughs> uh -huh. I really just say um, this idea of like faith in people, so mm -hmm. a belief in something unknown and unseen. Mm -hmm. And when these people said, look, do you care about this issue? Are you passionate mm -hmm. about the plight of young people and families? Are you incensed by it? Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's a, it's a form of justice that you need to address? And I said, absolutely, and that's how I got on board. Wow. Yeah. So, Christina, did you have a same divine type of call? <laughs> um, maybe not as divine as so, <laughs> but it wasn't until I actually got into La Casa Norte when we um, started having our first all staff meetings, and then I found out about um, our acuerdos of La Casa Norte, the activities that we would do um, during our staff meetings. Then it was the divine calling, um, especially with the acuerdos because it's like, if you go to one of our staff meetings, you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, um, well, well, tell us what they are briefly. So, oh, briefly, well, please. Was, <laughs> <laughs> um, empathy, I don't remember. That's good. Um, respect, working collaboratively, resources. Um, providing resources. We are create justice, justice yeah. and opportunities for families and young adults. So you, you uh, applied for the position and just got hired in, and you just started learning, or? I, it was just more, it was more than learning. Mm -hmm. It was really um, taking on a lifestyle um, mm -hmm. that meant if I'm going to be working at La Casa Norte, I mm -hmm. also have to believe in what I'm doing in my work. So I started at La Casa Norte as actually a case manager and then um, took a little break, came back, and now I'm their information and referral specialist. Something brought you back. Oh yeah, a lot of stuff <laughs> brought me back. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things about La Casa Norte that brought me back. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us about, um, you said you're the f uh, founding executive director, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the founder, right? Correct, yeah. Who created La Casa yeah. Norte and why? Yeah, so there's a small group of people mm -hmm. uh, who've known each other for about 25 years, and they had volunteered at other homeless shelters throughout the city of Chicago, um, and two in particular really took it on, a gentleman named Keith and, and a gentleman named Peter, mm -hmm. and they were both ex-Vietnam vets, and one of the things that they saw in the city of Chicago was there's a real lack of resources for beds and units dedicated to homeless youth, and so mm -hmm. they wanted to do something about that, mm -hmm. and uh, they, what, they went around and they talked to other nonprofits and they said, you know, can we help you build something for homeless youth or can we do this? And there right. wasn't really a focus or attention on homeless youth. And then they said, okay, well, we have to do this ourselves. Let's figure it out. And they actually went to different communities in the city of Chicago and said, can we, can we be here? Can we start this nonprofit here? And many communities said no. <laughs> I imagine so. Yeah. And, um, and it was Humble Park and there was a group of pastors. Again, God, right? <laughs> our faith, <laughs> our, our sort of divine calling. Uh -huh. But there was a group of local pastors, the uh -huh. Humble Park Ministerial Association 
association who said we would welcome that you would start a nonprofit dealing with homeless youth and families. Wow. And so that's how I met them at uh, the local church I was volunteering at the time. And so they put some real thought into it. They'd been fundraising and passing the hat at their dinner parties. Really? And they'd figure out how to put a 501c3 together. So they had an idea, they had money, and they had, they had a little bit of money, and they had some will and desire. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was part of the team that was, came in and executed, right, and actually made it happen. Um, so how, how were those early days? Uh after they had the dinner parties and had the money and, and they did have obviously like you said the will to make mm -hmm. it happen they pulled you in and how were those early days of the organization yeah. it's it's um you're dealing with people in very difficult mm -hmm. circumstances um and yet that's not like nonprofits um have an easy life themselves yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember um, for the first few years, mm -hmm. Juan Carlos, my mother would always say, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> and I'd say, well, this is a real job. And then she started to say, um, when can you give yourself a raise? <laughs> so, oh, it doesn't work like that either. But uh, I think you're, you're exactly right. Those first few years, I was employee number one. We hired another employee. Uh, and, mm -hmm. then, and then it wasn't until our second year that we actually hired our third employee. Mm -hmm. But what we found is that the community truly welcomed us. Mm -hmm. So we hung up our little shingle on the door on the North Avenue corridor at 3500, you know, 30, 3500 West on North Avenue, and mm -hmm. the community immediately began to respond. People began to walk in, mm. call, say, hey, I, I heard you can provide some kind of help. So even though we were obviously a new and struggling nonprofit when it comes to, mm -hmm. to just resources, um, there was a lot of support from the community at large in terms of, yes, we, we need you here and we, we want you here. So um, they began calling to refer people or to ask for help themselves? Yeah, both, both, both yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, that's the thing about mm -hmm. um, Chicago's neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you plop anything, you open up a business, anything on a main corridor, right. uh, particularly in Latino and African-American communities, mm -hmm. uh, people knock on the door and say, what, what, what's going on here? You <laughs> right, know, what right, are you right. doing here? Or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you help? So, uh, it, and we're very much in the fabric, in the neighborhood, being in, in West Humble Park. So that that was 12 years ago. 12 we years were ago now. Two employees uh, and a little bit of money in the bank. And fast forward today, we are 12. We are 12 years old. We're a little over 60 employees. 60. Yeah, mm -hmm. over 60. And we have helped. We've counted almost over 20,000 individuals over the course of these last 12 years. Well, so tell me. Uh, certainly, homelessness is a is a problem. In I, I, I was just speaking earlier to one of my colleagues here. It can be a problem in a lot of our cities around the world, but uh, how, is it, how have you seen it change between the starting, uh, when the organization was born, and now the economy's gone through a lot of changes. Um, times have been very difficult for a lot of folks. Um, how have you seen that problem differently? This question is for both of yeah. you. Um, mm -hmm. And, and how, you, how have you responded as an organization? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I'll start, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. exactly right. When we started in 02, mm -hmm. uh, we had a mission of specifically wanting to do something for homeless youth mm -hmm. and male youth in particular, because there were no programs mm -hmm. dedicated just to male youth. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen over the course of the last 12 years is that the Great Recession that began in 2007 and 2008 mm -hmm. truly impacted families. Mm -hmm. So what we see now more than ever are families confronting homelessness. Mm -hmm. And there is a misconception I think that the general public has around who is homeless. Perhaps we see a panhandler downtown right, or right, right, someone right. at the expressway and they are in, in a, obviously some type of crisis because mm -hmm. they wouldn't be begging on the street just for fun, right? Yeah. But what they're not seeing and mm -hmm. who's really showing up at the shelters and who's overcrowded is families. So moms and dads with kids. Okay. Uh, there's wow. a true explosion of this type of need since the Great Recession. And that's specifically, specifically because of loss of employment and a true lack of affordable housing in the city. Right, right. Um, it's funny that you say they, we, they call it the Great Recession, but for these folks, it's not a recession. It's that's not right. this low period, it's a period where they lost a lot of what they owned. Mm -hmm. And um, they come to you, you see, when we were mm -hmm. talking earlier, you said that you're like this, I guess, I didn't. I don't know if you used the word glorified, but I'm, I'll mm -hmm. use a glorified receptionist, so you're referring them, you're working mm -hmm. with people, make, taking calls. Um, how is it when you receive a family? What? How does Casa Norte respond to that? Well, since I'm technically the first person um, that does like the assessment with them, 
I try very hard to really, first of all, make sure that they feel that they're welcome and that they're safe, especially if they're coming from a shelter, because um, some of them might be coming from shelters that are not family-based or it's just an open gym, and there's a lot of fear, a lot of mistrust, a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication. So I've got four walls of, um, of like barriers that I have to confront and letting them know that mm -hmm. here at La Casa Norte, you're gonna be safe, no one's gonna call. Um, the police, someone's gonna call immigration, because sometimes some of these families unfortunately don't have um, certain documentation that they need in order to get further services. So and you do have a lot of undocumented folks coming in? I, w I wouldn't be able to say what percentage, I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but because of certain um, questions that we do ask and they don't have access to certain papers, whether if they were lost or somebody right. stole them because they've been moving from place to place or, or they were just lost mm -hmm. in general. Um, from moving around, it's, um, it's hard for me to say what percentage, but again, there is that fear because it's like if you don't have your ID, then they might think that you're like doing some type of activity that you're not supposed to be doing. Right. So. The first thing is definitely the safety part, um, so that once the safety is established, then we can really openly talk about what are some of the challenges and barriers that they're confronting. Once we get to that, um, I really try to pull in and, and in my brain and in my head, like the resources that La Casa Norte has, also any current partnerships or new partnerships, mm -hmm. emails that have been sent out about other places that have either apartment wait list, um, food pantries, or whatever it is that um, we send each other as a whole, like uh, new resources out in different communities. And then um, from there, if it's not really what they're looking for, then really kind of looking at, cre for me, I, th I think it takes this talent of, and skill of being creative. Because if unfortunately this person comes in or this family comes in and they're a family of six and there's no shelter that can, that can take them, yeah. we've got to really think of something when it's zero below mm. outside. You know, like, okay, or if they don't want to go to a shelter, like, right. why is that? So then what, what other options are there? Is there the option that they can go to perhaps a church, you know, are they are they active in a church mm -hmm. or is there a community organization or a family friend? Maybe some of the stuff that they haven't thought about because of the trauma that they go through. Right. Um, but I've, I've found that when you start thinking creatively and like kind of like out of the box, when the resources that are limited either are not available for them in that moment, at least you can offer them options and let them decide which one they feel the safest route for them. So and the options, like you, you mentioned, can be a church or mm -hmm. another shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and what else? Family members. Family members. That's um, something that yeah, we might not think about. It. I mean, mm -hmm. Having, I guess, um, the courage to ask because mm -hmm. you sure. know, it's a very difficult uh, mm -hmm. circumstances to be in, right? Absolutely. And, pl mm -hmm. and plus it's also breaking down stereotypes. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, a, it's about breaking down stereotypes of like a person who's homeless, a lot of like she's saying, we, yeah. we tend to think, you know, unfortunately, the person we see with the cup, mm -hmm. or um, the person who may have a mental illness, and we see them yelling or mm -hmm. talking to themselves on mm -hmm. the street. Mm -hmm. um, but, but obviously, there those are we see those, and we tend to think these folks have issues. That's why they're homeless. We don't we don't see behind that or underneath mm -hmm. that, or or mm -hmm. think of homeless folks as being families, as you're, as you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things we know in the state of Illinois last year, mm -hmm. we counted over 50,000 students in that, Illinois schools right. wow. that were experiencing homelessness. Right here in Chicago, the Chicago public school system, that number was a little over 17,000. 17,000. Just in our last school year. So that's kindergartners all the way up through 12th graders experiencing homelessness, right? Mm -hmm. wow. Some of them are on their own, what we call unaccompanied homeless youth, and those are some of the young people that La Casa Norte work with, mm -hmm. but also some of those kindergarten through 12th graders are part of families, wow. right? And mm -hmm. there might be a mom, a dad, a, a grandma. So mm -hmm. again, and, and, and I think the other thing, you know, one of the things that we love about Christina that she does mm -hmm. so well, and she said mm -hmm. it was being creative, but um, it's really being empathetic mm -hmm. and it's really understanding mm -hmm. that homelessness is right. not an identity, it's a circumstance. Right. And mm -hmm. so whether it's the person on the side of the road or youth or family, no one chooses 
is this lifestyle, right? right? It's something that they're experiencing because of a multitude of barriers or challenges. Right, it's right, right. oftentimes not sort of one thing that we can point to and say, if we just gave them this one thing, that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know, right. it, it is that one challenge and, and a, a small amount of money can make a difference, but other times there's multiple barriers that, that families and communities in this city and in this country are dealing with. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So um, you're saying, and, and I think it's so, so appropriate what you're saying, the empathy and the mm -hmm. not stereotyping or not labeling people in a certain way. Because yeah, I think mm -hmm. the, um, I guess my own perception of how we view homelessness is we tend to think, oh, that's just a homeless guy. Mm -hmm. Or the other words that are used, um, that he's just a bum or she's a bum or whatever. Oh, yeah. We tend to th speak that way, I'm, I'm including myself because mm -hmm. I, I know I've done it or have thought it. Um, but you're, you're saying empathy and especially this, this empathy with young people. How do, how, do, how do you work with that? Because that's something that's mm -hmm. so unseen and I, right. we don't think about it. Uh, kindergarteners up until, well, obviously, I don't think kindergartners going to be on their own, but certainly yeah. adolescents. <laughs> sure, that's right. Under, uh, uh, how do you work with them? How do you bring them into La Casa Norte and help them through this incredibly, uh, yeah. in, uh, incredibly difficult circumstance? Yeah. Well, I, I love the work that we do with young people because, mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about an intervention that's going to make a difference. I mean, if we don't do something mm -hmm. now with young people, I mean, that's the ghost of Christmas future, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, right, right, and right. it's a real opportunity to also see the best mm -hmm. of a human spirit. Young people have amazing coping mechanisms, right? They are very resilient. They can bounce back. Yeah. Uh, and young people are looking for assistance. So um, again, there's a misconception that young people who are on the streets are, you know, gang involved or perpetrating crimes. And it's mm -hmm. usually the opposite. Homeless young people, uh, they're looking for assistance. They're, they're often the right. prey. They're often the victims, mm. not the predators. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we do first and foremost with young people, with youth, which you think is so important, is to be accepting mm -hmm. and non-judgmental of them. Mm. We know the adolescent brain is dealing with a lot during this time period. Right. Their, their hormones and their brains are not on the same <laughs> level. Right. Right. And so they're trying to catch up. And so they're testing authority. They're trying to figure out what's their identity. How do they identify? What are the things that are important to them? They have all these external pressures. Mm -hmm. So when they come to La Casa Norte, we're all about, look, we accept you for who you are, however you want to be called, however you want to say you are, mm -hmm. and two, we're not non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. And really saying to the young person, look, what do you want for your life? What are your mm -hmm. hopes and dreams? And mm -hmm. how can we be like your partner, your coach? Because we're not your parents. Right. Your parents aren't there and aren't available for you for right. lots of different reasons. So we're not a parent, we're a partner and a coach and a role model. Mm -hmm. so and I think just to add to that is that when we offer that, um, just the understanding and that we're not going to be judgmental. It offers us the opportunity mm -hmm. to offer them options. You know, if, we, if we're not going to be able to provide that, then it's going to be like, okay, what am I doing here then if, if I'm just another kid hanging out? But instead, being able to say like, you know, you can be who you are and, and we trust you and you're in a safe place and everything offers us as the staff, as the providers, an opportunity to be able to use our resources, to use our skills, to be able to um, help that youth, not even help, but support them. Mm -hmm. And um, like for, I have, I have a perfect example. I just so happen That's what I was to, gonna <laughs> just ask you right now. I, I was just gonna ask so you more happen for example. Yes. To, um, this past year, just this past year, there were two youth in particular that I was working with. One of them, I mean, she had, <coughs> she had a lot of stuff going on. It just so happened we were both pregnant at the same time. <laughs> and so we really connected in that sense. Mm -hmm. But she had been living on the street, um, just involved in some <coughs> stuff that was um, not the safest for her. Yeah, pregnant and on the street, wow. Yeah, and, and then I was talking to her about, hey, you know, have you gone to this clinic? I go, and and this is the part where I mean, like, it's not just the lessons that I was learning, but also a lifestyle, because I'm like, if I was telling her that I was gonna go to this clinic, 
I also went to that clinic. Mm. And so I was able to explain to her, when you walk into the door, this is what they're gonna ask you. This is the case manager at the clinic that you can talk to. This is who's there. So right. it was just like, I could picture her going into that clinic when she was telling me that she was gonna go. Right. Um, because I had gone there. And mm -hmm. so when she came back and we debriefed about her experience of um, her follow up with her, with her pregnancy, it was, we, I really felt that strong connection with her. Mm -hmm. And so since I've been back on maternity leave, I haven't seen her, but everybody keeps telling me like, she's great, you know, she's back in school now. And, and it mm -hmm. just, I'm like gonna get emotional. It makes me with, really happy right, because yeah. it's like, you know, here she was on the street. Now she has a car, mm -hmm. now she has a dog. She's also going back to school. Wow, how and old is she by the way? She, um, 21 if I'm not mistaken. Pretty young still, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's so, lots of stories like yeah, that. I mean, right. we were—I was just with a young man, and um, and he came to us when he was 18 years old, and he left uh, an abusive household. So his stepfather was both verbally and physically abusive, wow. and it got to the point. And he tells his own story, and it's so powerful. He says that one day they just got in this horrible, horrible fight, and his mother didn't defend him, and his mother—they kicked him out. And his mother said to him, "I wish you'd been aborted." Wow. Mm -hmm. And as an 18 year old boy, mm -hmm. to hear that, right, right, right? right? He left, he had a backpack, he had two garbage bags full of clothes. He was walking around, and it was through a school connection that referred him to La Casa Norte. Right. Mm -hmm. Over the past, he's been there about uh, a little under two years, about 18 months, he's been living in our transitional housing program. And I have to tell you, the young man that he was a year and a half ago to who he is today is amazing. He's almost completed his associate's degree. He attends Harold Washington College wow. um, full time. Uh, he has uh, almost a 3.2 grade point average, and he has a part-time job working in the field in which he wants to go into, which is primary education. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's a huge advocate mm -hmm. uh, for the community. He participated in Street Soccer USA, and they, they did uh, the Midwest Championships and got to go to New York. And last year, with the help of La Casa mm -hmm. Norte, he was on our Bank of America Charity Marathon team. And this wow. young man, well, you 19 years charity old, charity yeah, mm -hmm. he ran his first marathon. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, we're getting close to the end of the yeah. show. And these are all great stories and we, we need to hear them because mm -hmm. a lot of times we, we see organizations but we don't know the stories. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the um, other services you provide for the community because you work with homeless uh, youth, uh, homeless families, and, but um, as part of that process of helping people come out of that, uh, what else do you give them? Yeah, so just really quickly, mm -hmm. we have housing programs mm -hmm. and we have service uh, programs. And mm -hmm. housing is emergency shelter, transitional shelter, and permanent housing permanent with housing. support services too. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's for families and youth. Mm -hmm. And then on the services side, we do therapy, counseling, case management. We help people get bus passes. We help people get documentation like IDs or a driver's license. Mm -hmm. We also help with nutrition and education by providing people with food or food vouchers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also extensive referrals for employment, education, advocacy, um, health care access, whatever right. it is that they may also need. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that's you pretty much yeah. said it. Yeah. get it all in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so, and just really put it um, mm -hmm. all great in a great um, package of like the services and the work that we do. Um, but again, I think the important thing is for people to, re every every person that calls, every family is unique. Mm -hmm. So okay. the important mm -hmm. thing, and their needs are very unique. So right. I really strongly encourage that if there are individuals who are confronting homelessness, um, or if you know someone who is confronting homelessness, right. just to give us a call mm -hmm. and find out, you know, through our partnerships with the city, through other organizations, what can we have available in order to support you in your time of need. Yeah. Well, well, thanks so much for coming out today yeah, and sharing yeah. this with uh, with us and all the great your, all the work you're doing for mm -hmm. all our folks out in the community. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perspectivas Latinas is a community service of CAN TV. If your nonprofit organization would like to work with CAN TV, call 312-738-1400 and ask for nonprofit services. Tune into Perspectivas Latinas for local issues and concerns every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. on CAN TV 21. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Thank you for joining us.